to Love the Truth Media, a teaching ministry of Pastor Steve Wiseman of Peewee Valley Baptist Church in Peewee Valley, Kentucky. To learn more about the many resources available through this ministry, visit us online at lovethetruthmedia.com. And now, here's Pastor Steve to bring you a special message from the Word of God. Turn in your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We're going to have a special message. We've interrupted again our verse-by-verse study in 2 Corinthians uh, here um, to talk about uh, the second appearance of God, Christ Himself coming again. Amen? And uh, so last week we talked about uh, the first appearance of Christ uh, on that which we celebrate uh, this time of the year as his birth, uh, coming in the form of a man, made himself of no reputation, became obedient to his Father in heaven, even unto death itself. Now we're going to talk about the fact that he's coming back and what we should be doing in the meantime. And uh, let's take a look at this. Stand with me if you're able. We're going to read this passage out of 1 Thessalonians beginning um, chapter 4 and verse 1. And we're going to uh, skip a little section there uh, in this. Uh, as you note in the bulletin there, we're going to read down to verse 7 and then move to verse 13. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning um, with verse uh, 1, the scripture says, Furthermore then, we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as you have received of us how you ought to walk and to please God, so you would abound more and more. For you know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus, for this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor, not in the lust of uh, concupiscence, which is sensuality, even as the Gentiles who know not God, that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter, because the Lord is the avenger of such, as we also have forewarned you and testified. For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. Look down to verse 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also who sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not literally precede here, prevent, them who are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Father, we're thankful for your word. Literally, uh, it is the truth. Father, we depend upon it. We search it. We, we allow it to penetrate our hearts. We believe it. And Father... We act on it. Uh, We want to be faithful in the days ahead to do this which you say. Father, may it be a reality in each of our lives, for it's in Christ's name that we ask it. Amen. You may be seated. So I titled our message today, uh, The Second Appearance of Mighty God, of the Mighty God, if you will. Last week, we talked about it was the Mighty God in the angel, in the, uh, the manger, and how that God himself was in the manger, being preeminent and being the savior of the world. Today, we want to talk about the second appearance of the mighty God. We called Christ the mighty God last week. That's what Isaiah called him. That's one of the names that uh, has been given to our Lord Jesus Christ, the mighty God. 
So we're going to talk about the second time he's coming because he's coming again. We don't know when he's coming. We don't know when he's coming, but he's coming. Uh, and so we can't, you know, in our, in our lifetime, we sort of put things off until we get older. I believe, unfortunately, uh, or sadly, I should say, a lot of people who don't accept Christ use as an excuse, whether it's from the heart or not, I don't know, but they use as an excuse that I'll wait until I get older and okay, but I don't need it now. I'm going to live a long time. We don't know how long we're going to live. We don't know. And it's not so much as when Christ is going to come for his second appearance, but how long are we going to live? A passage we just read depicts the fact that Christ is coming back to receive uh, all those in Christ, whether they be dead or alive. And he's going to raise everybody up to be with him for eternity. But first, I want to start in a passage in John chapter 14. We're going to come back to this passage in a little while. It's one of the passages we're going to use today. We'll use a few of them. But in John chapter 14, um, if you look at the first verse, uh, I got three parts uh, that the Lord laid on my heart to deliver by way of message today, and that is regarding his second appearance. We need to think about it. We need to spend some time meditating on it, and I put we need to ponder the second appearance. Then we're going to talk about preparing for the second appearance, and the third thing we're going to talk about is our desire, if you will, for the second appearance of Christ. But here, let's take a look at the second appearance. Let's ponder it and think about it. The Bible has much to say about it. We're going to just take a look at a couple of highlights about that which announces it, if you will. But Jesus himself said, as he was quoted by the Apostle John in John 14 and verse 1, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. Of course, at this time, John was conveying the fact that Jesus and the Father are the same. They're one. They are the same. They're the same. They're the same God. And so he says in verse 2, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Uh, I go to prepare a place for you. So Christ himself is preparing a place. Here he is talking to his disciples. He's preparing a place for us. And then, and to the apostles directly here in verse 3, and if I go and prepare a place, and the word if there doesn't mean if I go, uh, it means since I go, because he's already said that um, he's, that he's, uh, he's going to leave. So he says, and if I go, or since I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. The word come means appear. I will come and appear again. Because he's not going to come to the earth. He's going to come, his next appearance, his first appearance was coming in the form of a man. His second appearance will be coming in the clouds uh, to rapture the church, as we have called it. He's going to catch up, if you will, all believers, dead or alive. And then the third time he appears is when he's going to come in judgment and judge the evil and he's going to set up his thousand-year reign on earth uh, where the devil will be bound for a thousand years. There'll be no evil influence by the devil or his demons. But he said, I will come again. It's a promise by Jesus to his apostles. And thus it's been conveyed in the scriptures to be a promise to every believer, not just believer, but unbelievers. There will be a judgment day for unbelievers. But as believers, we can look forward to it the day when Jesus comes again. It may be in our lifetime. We don't know that. But we should live uh, our lives in such a manner as it would be pleasing to God in every respect, anticipating that Christ is coming because he is. He says here, <clears throat> if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you. He's going to receive us unto himself. I'm going to receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Now, in verse 4 it says, 
and where I go, you know, and the way, you know. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. As he goes on uh, to say down in verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. So Jesus is the only way. Uh, I was in the presence of somebody not long ago and said, well, you say Merry Christmas, you ought to say Happy Hanukkah to people. I'm not saying Happy Hanukkah to anybody. I'll say Merry Christmas, uh, understanding that Christmas as we celebrate it is the birth of Christ. And it doesn't matter that it's the, the day that he was born, the fact that we celebrate his birth because it was so crucial for our salvation. Our salvation could not have happened because that was God's plan to do it that way. And so we should celebrate the birth of Christ, and we should celebrate, if you will, as we do in the season of Easter, as we call it, the resurrection of Christ from the dead. Because he went and paid the price for our sins and had to die, because without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. But Christ will come to receive us one day. We don't know when, but we got the promise. And it's a personal promise from Christ. As, as uh, John quotes him here in verse 3, Christ says, I will come again and receive you unto myself. It doesn't get any better than that. It doesn't get any better. You know, holidays and, you know, we usually have some visitors in the house and we prepare our place so that we can receive visitors. This is nothing like that. But look at all the preparations we make. And the more important the visitors, the more preparation we make, right? Uh, well, since Christ is going to come again and receive us unto himself, we should prepare for that day when he comes. We should prepare. Now, if you take a look over at um, 1 Corinthians 15, uh, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15 And go down towards the end of the chapter to verse uh, 51. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 51. So if we're going to ponder his second appearance, number one, we realize Jesus said himself, I'm coming again to receive you unto myself. And we understand from that passage that we read over in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verses 13 to 17 that Jesus talked about the fact that he's going to come in the air and those who are dead in Christ or sleep in Christ, as the scripture calls it, because those who are, as we call dead, if they're, if they're Christians, they're actually sleeping according to the scriptures because the spirit and soul are not with the body. The body is just waiting for the second appearance of Christ. And when he comes, they're coming out of the grave. The soul and spirit will be joined with the body. That's what's going to happen. And those who are alive in Christ shall join them in the air. And we shall ever be with the Lord. So he's going to come for us. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 tells us how that's going to happen. And chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians in verses 50, uh, 51 and a couple of verses after that tell us what happens to us at that time. And in verse 50, because 1 Thessalonians 4 tells us that we're coming out of the grave if we've already died, and that will be the vast majority of believers. There will, be, there will be those who, on the day of his appearance, that will just go up and they'll be um, changed in the twinkling of an eye uh, from where they are, along with the dead. But in 1 Corinthians 15, 51, here's what happens to us. Behold, Paul wrote to the Corinthians, I show you a mystery. Mystery is that which was previously unknown, and here is being revealed as God revealed this through Paul, not only to the Corinthians, but to the church, to the world. It says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. Uh, again, that word sleep for Christians means die. We shall not all die because there will be some who will be alive uh, when Christ appears in the air. So not everybody's going to sleep, but we shall all be changed, whether you're in the grave or not in the grave. 
we're all going to be changed. And so those who come out of the grave and those who are alive, we're all going to look alike. We're all going to look alike. We're going to have a transformed body that is going to be perfect. Fit for heaven to be in the presence of our Savior who is perfect. So, <clears throat> but we're going to be changed. We're all going to be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. Um, and uh, a moment is a very small uh, period of time. The twinkling of an eye, twinkling is a rapid movement. It's like the gushing of a wind, if you will, or, um, or maybe the swiftness of a bird in flight. That's what twinkling is. The twinkling of an eye, the eye is the, uh, of the observable parts of the body, it's the fastest thing that moves in the body. So the twinkling of an eye is referred to be, it's entirely quick, and it refers to the eye, which means the eye probably will miss it. The world's going to miss us. <laughs> Boom, we're going to be gone. And they're going to, you know, they're not going to have an instant replay. <laughs> They might be a lot of security cameras around and they're going to see people disappear. But even that, I don't know if the cameras will be able to pick it up. But in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, what's going to happen at the last trump? Because he read over there in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 that at the, in the last trump, in the, if you will, that Michael the archangel will come and blow the trumpet, right? So at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, that means perfectly holy, and we shall be changed, uh, for this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. We're going to be transformed into a body that will last forever. Forever is a long time. People fear death thinking that's the end of their existence. Before the, before the believer, eternity is a blissful period that never ends. We can't even call it a period. It's just time that never ends. For the unbeliever, there's a period of time that never ends, but it'll be nothing but agony and defeat and pain and torment for eternity. But the believer... We're going to put on immortality, that is eternal life. So in verse 54, so when this, un, when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Jesus proved victory over death at the grave when he died for our sins, rose out of the grave, and now is in the portals of heaven. And when he appears again, it's too late for people to think, oh, oh, I should have trusted in Christ. It's going to happen so fast, they don't have time to think. There's not going to be time. But those who know Christ, when he comes when in, in the air and he appears, we're going to be changed just like that. And we're going to have a, an incorruptible and immortal body with soul and spirit, and will be victorious over death. Now that's pondering the second appearance of Christ. Now let's take a look at preparing, if you will. So look to 1 Peter chapter 1. So are there some preparations we should do? Yes, yes. Specifically directed by scriptures. We understand generally, generally, and it's just as true as any of the passages that we'll read today, that we are obligated by God to live a life that is faithful to him as his children, is faithful to him. So we're going to talk about that. And there's a word that we're going to use here in 1 Peter chapter 1, uh, verse 7. Uh, and let's read that verse, 1 Peter 1, 7. That the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold... Um, uh, that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, and that refers back to the faithfulness during trials that is described just prior to this verse. Um, though um, it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the what? At the appearing of Jesus Christ. 
So when he appears, we understand the appearance, what is gonna, what's going to transpire, what's going to happen to us. Until that time, we need to be preparing. And Peter says it well here, and we're talking about the trial of our faith. And that's the faithfulness that's required in believers because life is nothing but a series of trials for the believer, a series of tests, if you will. And being faithful means that we would do what, what Peter wrote here, that in the trying of our faith, um, that we will be found, if you will, unto praise and honor and glory. Praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Christ. Now look uh, at verse 8 where it says, Whom having not seen, has in, have any of us seen Christ? No. No, we haven't seen him. Whom, whom having, and, and neither had the audience that Peter was writing to here, whom having not seen, you love, in whom though now you see him not, yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, because we love him. We haven't seen him, but we know who he is. And we know he's the way, the truth, and the life. He's the way to eternal life, and he's the only way. And we put our faith in him. So uh, skip down to verse 13 in this chapter. It says, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. The loins of your mind. You know, when they went to battle in those days, uh, the warriors, uh, the armies, they, they wore garments and then they would loosen them up so they could be agile and quick and, and they could handle all of the tasks necessary in order to fight a battle. And so they could move quickly and swiftly and, and, and be able to counter attacks, if you will. And here it's, not, it's used as a metaphor talking about our mind. You know, the scripture says in Philippians chapter 2 that let your mind, uh, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. And so it's that attitude, it's that mindset, it's how we think um, and how we believe. So gird up the loins of your mind, that is prepare for the spiritual battle that is raging around us. Gird up the loins of your mind. we got to be prepared to fend off the attacks of the devil. Give no opportunity to the devil, the scripture says. And in fact, uh, James wrote in the scriptures that we need to humble ourselves before God. And resist the devil and then he'll flee from us. How do we resist? With the word of God. And that doesn't mean you hold your Bible up and say, devil, here it is. No. <laughs> it's our mind. And that's why we need to gird up the loins of our mind so we can resist the devil. And it says to be sober. That's, that's spiritually sober, which speaks of self-control. To be able to control ourselves. Control ourselves for what? For temptations that are going to come our way and the trials that are going to weigh heavy upon us. That And through all of those things, we're going to remain faithful and steadfast in the Lord, not being moved by our circumstances. We're going to be sober and hope to the end. The end was when the last trump's going to sound and Jesus appears and takes us up to be with him or when we pass away and go to sleep, if you will. And then it will raise us up one day. But we need to be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And this revelation of Jesus will be that second appearance in the sky. And so we find, and boy, what grace that will be. We don't deserve heaven. We don't deserve it. In no way, shape, or form Nobody can, nobody can earn it. Nobody could merit it by anything they do. It's only by the grace of God that we actually receive the gift of salvation, which is free from God through faith in Christ. And so what amazing grace that Christ is going to come back in the air and he's going to take us home to be with him evermore. Amen. Well, I tell you what, it gets a, gets a, should get a believer excited here. And in verse 14, as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves, and that means to be conforming. Uh, it's like Romans chapter 12 says, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, right? When you're saved. So as obedient children, not fashioning or being transformed to um, according to the former lust in your ignorance, because we were ignorant of Christ. That is not that we were as stupid, but that we did not acknowledge him as Christ. And 
It's a fool that denies the Lord. So that's why we can call everybody who denies Christ as being ignorant in the King James language because they don't care. So not fashion yourselves according to your former lust, but in verse 15, this is how we should prepare. As he who hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner, literally, of life here. <clears throat> so in verse 16, because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. So Peter writes and reminds us of that Old Testament passage to be holy. What does holy mean? It means to be mature spiritually. Holy and sanctification. Sanctification means to be separated. Holy means to be separated. Why is that the case? Because holy and sanctification are translations from the same Greek word. When you see sanctification, you see holy, you see sanctified. It's all related to that same word. So being holy and being sanctified are the same thing, but because... It is written, be holy for I am holy. And if you call on the Father who without respect to persons judge according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. Because you are not redeemed with incorruptible, with, with corruptible things. We're redeemed by the blood of Christ. And so the general requirement is to be holy and to be sanctified. They both mean to be separated to God separated to God and separated from evil or sin. What it means. And the reason for the separation is because, number one, God demands it. And number two, when we separate from the evil and we separate ourselves to God, we are then placing ourselves at his disposal to use us as he wants because we're no longer our own. We've been bought with a price. We're literally a slave for Christ. When Christ came, he told the Jews, I came not to do my own will, but the will of my Father who's in heaven. Will is desire. We should want to do the desires of the Father. So generally speaking, we are to be holy, sanctified, that is, mature spiritually in Christ, doing the will of the Father from the heart. Now look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, uh, where we read this passage a while ago. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 in the first verse again. <clears throat> and here we're going to talk in the first verse about how to live. How should we live our lives? Uh, and how do we know that? Because that's what the scripture says. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and in verse 1, Paul wrote to the church at Thessalonica. He said, furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you, by the Lord Jesus, in other words, we are representing Jesus here, that as you have received of us how you ought to walk, that is, the gospel that was preached unto the uh, Thessalonians is the same gospel that is preached to us. It's, the gospel hasn't changed. It's the same. It's not different at any point in time. It's always the same. The word of God never changes, and it will last for eternity. That as you have received of us how you ought to walk and to please God, that you would abound more and more. He doesn't say that you would do. He doesn't say that. He says that as you would, um, as you would ought to walk and please God, that you would do that. No, that you would abound more and more. That means that we keep getting better at it. Better by God's standards, not man's. Better by God's standards. Better can only come through a close relationship with God and his word. It's the only way better can be achieved. So we, we make ourselves available to God, and that means we make ourselves available for him to communicate to us. And God doesn't speak to us today in an audible voice, so how is he going to speak to us? Through his word. Hebrews 1.1 tells us that. That in, time, in times past, a sundry that God spoke through the prophets, but now he speaks through his word, which is, which is, which is a fire. And it even, it, it's like a sword and it divides, divides asunder soul and spirit, bone, and even discerns our thoughts. So that's what we subject ourselves to God's word on a regular, continuous basis is so that we can walk and please God 
as the scripture tells us, and that we would continue to grow. Peter wrote in his second letter at the end that we need to grow, need to grow in faith and wisdom. So in verse 2, for you know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. I know people say, well, the commandments are in the Old Testament. Uh, What the New Testament says and what the Old Testament says are not suggestions by any stretch of the imagination. People like to read the scriptures, find their favorite verses, and live by them. A lot of people do that. And they have, uh, people have come to term that a life verse. Uh, the, the word sh- is our life. The word is literally our life. Not a particular phrase, not a verse, not a, not a, a paragraph or a chapter or a book out of scripture. The entire word of God is critically important to our spiritual growth if we're going to mature. But we know the commandments that were given by the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 3, for this is the will of God. We should always listen when the scripture says this is the will of God. And what is God's will in our life? Sanctification. Sanctification. And this is a passage there at the end where we have read where the appearing of Christ is all important. Uh, And like we read verse 13 regarding that, and it says, but I would not have you to be ignorant concerning them who are asleep that that, that you sorrow not, even as others. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again and sleep in Jesus, will God bring with him? For he's going to come and receive us unto himself, right? So in verse 3, this is the will of God, your sanctification, your separation from evil... Ephesians chapter 5 uh, really describes that separation so thoroughly from evil. You know, see, separated from evil and separated unto God. And unto God means we come to the Lord, we come to the Word of God, looking for and ambitious to receive that which God has for us so that we can our lives can be changed by the power of the Holy Spirit within us who will teach us, instruct us, interpret the word for us, and give us what we need in order to please God. Not to please ourselves, but to please God. But the will of God is our sanctification. If you look just a second at chapter uh, 5 and, uh, and verse 18, and everything give thanks for this is the will of God. And if you look down to verse uh, 23, it says, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. Sanctification comes from the word of God. Um, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, wholly, entirely, completely. And it says, And I pray that your whole spirit and soul and body, the emphasis is on whole here, completeness of this, Surrender to God, that He will sanctify us, and that our, our our spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's His appearing the second time. And so, go back to the first part of chapter four. So, the will of God is that sanctification, <clears throat> and in verse four. Why is the sanctification so important? That every one of you, every single believer, should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. Every believer. The vessel is the body that we have. It's called a tabernacle in the scriptures, called a vessel. Uh, But we have this earthly body. And what do we do with this body? This body is a huge distraction. Because it's flesh. Flesh and blood will not inherit the kingdom of God. But we got to live in this flesh. Paul talked about it in uh, Romans 6 and 7, particularly chapter 7. He talks about that struggle with the flesh. And the flesh doesn't mean the material matter, but it means what the flesh wants to do. The desires of the flesh, the lust of the flesh. The desires of the mind and the way that our flesh responds to the world. uh, And that is the worldly living, and that is that which is thrown at us by Satan himself and his demons. So even though 
Christ was holy God, he was still holy man. He still faced the temptations because he became holy man. And he faced all those temptations and he was perfectly sanctified through the whole process. John told his disciples in John chapter 17 that he sanctified himself. That's what God can do, right? And he can sanctify us. And this is that we should be sanctified. It's God's will. And we should know how to possess our body and our mind in sanctification and honor. Not, the contrast is, not in the lust or the desire of con- con- concupiscence, which is literally sensuality. It's just passionate desire, if you will. Strong desire. Even as the Gentiles who know not God. Don't be like the world. Got to be separate. That no man go beyond and defraud his brother, just an example, in any matter, because the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also have forewarned and testified. So an example is a simple thing like not being honest with people. The Lord avenges that. Because the Lord knows our heart. And we can't choose error over truth. We can't choose wrong over right. We can't choose sin over righteousness. It says in verse 7, For God hath not called us unto uncleanness. He hasn't called us to do those things. And uncleanness is that word that represents all sin. God has not called us unto uncleanness. What has He called us unto? Holiness. Which is sanctification. Which is separation. And again, this is the passage that's preparing the hearts. And the, and the last verse of this chapter says, comfort one another with these words. So we should be comforted by that which is given to us that we might prepare, if you will. Now let's turn to uh, John chapter 17, a passage that I mentioned. <clears throat> John chapter 17. And look at verse 17. <clears throat> John 17, 17. Jesus told his disciples, he says, uh, he's praying to the Father here, and he's speaking this in the presence of the disciples, but he's speaking to the Father saying, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Sanctification comes from God. God is the word. And we're sanctified through the word. That's how we learn to be separated from the worldly things and set apart for the holy things of God. And our lifetime should be a a movement that moves us as close as we can possibly get to being wholly sanctified. When when, When the Lord appears the second time to take us up in the air, we will be completely separated from the world. So our sanctification and our righteousness becomes pure at that point. That's why we're incorruptible and immortal at that point. But if you look down to verse 19 here, it says, And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through what? The truth. We see that twice there. The truth is the Word of God. We're sanctified by the Word. We're not sanctified by just living better. We're sanctified by doing that which the Word instructs us to do. Because we we might get it confused that doing better means better by the world standards. That's not how we should live. We should live in accordance with the commandments that Jesus has given us. And we find those in the New Testament. We find them uh, in, in the four Gospels. But we find them as Paul and others wrote about the life of Christ and the principles and the commands that he taught. So it's not by living a life that's better in people's eyes, in our eyes, or that which we read and might know naturally or understand by the human mind. It's that which God has in His Word. That's why the Word sanctifies us. It sanctions, if you will, that which we do that is consistent with the Word of God. And God abhors the things that aren't consistent with the Word of God. So... We are sanctified by the word. And then look at 1 Timothy uh, chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. At 
And look at verse 11. 1 Timothy 6.11. And here the scripture says, But thou, O man of God, Paul addressing Timothy, he says, Flee these things. Talk about all those evil things that represent worldliness. And follow after. That means to pursue righteousness, godliness, faith. That's faithfulness to God. Love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith. Fight the good fight of faith. And that's how we fight the good fight of faith. And lay hold on eternal life unto which you were called. And then um, if you go down to verse 14 there, it says, That thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable until the appearing, the appearing, the second appearance of our Lord Jesus. Jesus Christ. Keep it. Guard it. Be obedient, if you will. Uh, I do want to look at John chapter 14. I was just pondering whether I want to do that, but I do. Uh, John chapter 14. We looked at the first few verses, but I want to look a little further down in the chapter. John 14 and look at verse 15. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Every believer says they love Jesus. Jesus says, since you love me, keep my commandments. It's pretty simple. Because in the first part of this chapter, he said, I'm coming again. So in the meantime, I want you, if you will, to keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither uh, knoweth him, but you know him for he dwelleth in you and shall be with you. And in verse 26, but the comforter who is the Holy Spirit, it says, whom the Father will send in my name and whom every believer has today, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance and whatever uh, and, and what, whatever I have said unto you. So there's no excuse. We have an enabler. You say, well, you know, I'm not quite smart enough. Every believer has the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is smart enough. Amen? He's God. God's living in us. He enables us. And, we, and He brings things to our memory. He can't bring things to our memory to use and to do unless we spend time in the Word to learn it as He teaches us. So we spend time in the Word. The Holy Spirit teaches us. Then we go out and, whoops, oh, Holy Spirit, He's going to take care of it. Because I'm set and determined to, to do what God says to fulfill His commandments. And so the process is laid out for us. We have every enablement to do it. So there's no excuse. The last thing I want to do is look at 2 Timothy chapter 4. And over here, <clears throat> it's told to us that what we should have, what we should have, 2 Timothy 4, what we... And uh, every believer should have it, is this passionate desire for the Lord's appearing. 2 Timothy chapter 4, and look at verse 6. <clears throat> now we understand that, um, you know, um, in verse 2 of chapter 4, Paul wrote to, wrote to Timothy and preached the word in season, out of season, Verses uh, 3 and following are about all the wicked and evil things that's going to happen in the world today. Um, and so he warns uh, Timothy to watch, that is to guard against all these things, endure all of this stuff. And, <clears throat> and so there in verse uh, 6 he says, For I am now ready to be offered. I'm ready. Though we've pondered the second appearance, we've looked at how to prepare for the second appearance, now we need to be ready. Are we ready? Are we ready for Christ coming in the air? Is there anything, because we need to bring praise and honor to Him through sancti being sanctified by the Word of God. Is there anything that we don't want to be present in our life when the Lord appears? 
and say, well, I got time. We don't know. We don't know. In verse 6 says, I'm ready to be offered. I'm ready, and then the time of my departure is at hand. I'm ready. Paul was about to die, and he knew it. And so he says in verse 8, excuse me, in verse 7, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. I've been faithful. I've finished what God gave me to do. What did God give him to do? Preach the gospel to the Gentiles. He did it, and he did it faithfully. He endangered his life on a regular, continuous basis. He was bold with the word and he spoke it even when people didn't want to hear it. Even when they opposed him and tried to kill him. He was faithful. He says, I fought a good fight. I finished my course. It's the course of life. We all have a course of life. A calling on our life by God. A course designed by God to please him. When our time is, comes, are we ready? And have we finished our course? So in verse 8, he says, Henceforth, that it means therefore, in the future, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. That's what day? The day of his appearing. He talks about it. He says, And not to me only, but unto all them that love his appearing. Everybody that is looking forward to the second appearance of Christ. We looked at the first appearance last week and talking about the birth of Christ, how he came and was a baby in a manger, born of a virgin, destined for a cross where he would pay the price of shedding his blood for your sins and mine and the sins of the world to be the savior of the world, the only savior of the world, the way, the truth, and the life. What we find here is this passage of scripture where Paul writes, I'm ready. I finished faithfully that which God gave me. And the crown of righteousness, uh, no doubt, is eternal life. That's what we get when God comes to get us. That's the most desired thing in this, in this whole wide world is life and life itself. Everybody wants to live longer and live healthy. Heaven is the place where that happens. But you've got to give your life to Christ in order to get there. You've got to surrender. There's no other way around it. I want to look at one verse in closing. Philippians chapter 3, verse 20. Lord laid it on the heart. <clears throat> Philippians chapter 3, verse 20. And there's a word here that doesn't mean today what it meant when it, the, the, script, the King James uh, translation was made. And it's a word conversation for our conversation. Conversation is a word that means citizenship. Citizenship. Our passport, if you have one, if we have one, says we're an American citizen. We're a citizen of the United States of America. <clears throat> for our citizenship is in heaven. We have an invisible yet real passport that we are citizens of heaven, not citizens of the United States of America. More important than living in America is our, our, we are, our home is not this earth. But even though we haven't been there, that's our home. Because our Father is there. Amen? Our Father is there. It says, for our citizenship is in heaven... From which also we look for the Savior. We look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We're looking for Him. Can't wait till He comes to take us home. Are you homesick for the Lord? Because when the Lord appears in the sky, we're going to be received by Him if we put our faith in Christ. And we're going to forever be in the presence of Almighty God where everything is absolutely perfect perfect are we looking for the savior are we desiring to be with the savior i think a lot of times the thought that i heard voiced by a man a long time ago who was the pastor and he said um i want to go to heaven but i don't want to be on the next bus uh you know it's uh 
It's that, Paul would have never said that. If they had buses back in those days, Paul would have said, I want to go to heaven and I want to be on the next bus. That's what it means to look for the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. To look for Him. He's coming again. He's going to appear in the sky. And we want to be on the next bus to get there. Because that's to be in the presence of our Father. We're in many sense, in, in many in many ways, like Lot's wife. There's so much here on earth that's holding us from looking for the Savior. And we're sort of, oh, He's going to come someday. We're too busy here. We're not spending time in the Word, being sanctified by the Word, looking, living faithfully for the Lord, and looking for Him to come. we got all this stuff to do. That's what Lot's wife, she was being taken out of Sodom and Gomorrah, and she looked back on it because that's where her heart was. That she wanted that. I think there are people that live in relationships too long because they 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 love that when they should be loving the Savior. We gotta we gotta do it God's way, and we've seen here today the second appearance. We saw the first appearance. It was the mighty God in the manger who was preeminent. God Himself, Savior of the world. And now we ponder His second appearing. Prepare for it. Be ready for it. And set our heart's desire on His appearing in the sky. He's coming. When, when, is, he com- when is He coming? Is He coming today? There was a guy in the church we got saved in, and he was, he was always talking about, when's the Lord coming? He's coming soon because he was looking for it. It's not that he had an attitude of being right or being wrong. He was biblical about his thought process. The Bible says he's coming soon. We don't know when soon is. Could be before we close the service today or before we get home from church or eat that meal that maybe is prepared or we're going to prepare when we leave here. The Lord Jesus is going to appear again. And we don't want to be, I don't know everybody's heart, but we don't want to be, we don't want to be around after he appears a second time, not on this earth. If we are, we're going to see his third appearance. <laughs> and that ain't going to be a pretty picture. It's going to be horrible. Let's look forward to the Lord's return. And what it really means to look forward to his return is living our life in such a way That that in itself shows we're anticipating his return any time now. And then God will be pleased. He'll be praised and honored by our life. Let's stand together. Father, we thank you for your word and for the message which you've given us today. Father, this time of the year is not just about a celebration of a holiday. But it is about our Lord Jesus Christ. The fact that he appeared the first time on earth. And then that is He is going to appear again and come and take His children home. And Father, we understand that only because You love us and have laid out a plan of salvation that through Your grace we can be saved through faith in Christ, not on any merit of our own. Father, because of that, we can with with good and full conscience look forward to the Savior by living our lives so that they would be pleasing to you according to your word as you sanctify us through your word. We give you praise and honor as we leave here today and go our separate ways that, Lord, we will continue to ponder and prepare for the next appearance of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. For it's in Christ's name that we ask it. Amen.